Good evening, welcome again to Mr C's Science Teacher. Thanks for coming here to do your homework. Luckily tonight, it's been quite a late one, so I've got a few supplies. I'm going to have a munch on this while you check out the objectives. Now, you might have already got to grips with uh, some of the easier objectives there, but clearly there's a lot of work to do, so let's get on. Okay, remembering that you're doing a flipped lesson, so you've got three definite steps in it, making notes, writing a summary of what you have learned in your own words, and then writing some questions about what you want to find out and ask in the next lesson. Okay, first step, we're going to learn about Ernest Rutherford and his experiment. Now, a bit of background to this. You need to know about Rutherford's experiment on alpha par particle scattering, but a background to this is that already what had been discovered was the electron. Now this scientist was studying mysterious rays that people thought were some sort of supernatural glow, but he proved that you could bend these rays with magnets and charged plates, I'll show you this in class and decided that that meant that they couldn't be rays or anything supernatural but in fact they were little tiny particles. Now he worked out that these little tiny particles must be sort of a thousand times smaller than an atom, much much smaller. And so his colleague Ernest Rutherford decided to try and work out how they would fit into an atom. Now the model that people had at the time was that maybe an atom was like a plum pudding or like a blueberry muffin or something like this. They thought that the electrons might be like the, the plums in the plum pudding, so little lumps that were stuck in like a positive sponge and the positive sponge was there to to balance out the negative charge of the electrons, but they weren't sure. So Rutherford did this. Okay, now here I've got something a bit like the plum pudding model. Here's all the positive sponge and the little blue dots representing the electrons. Now he used something which had just been discovered by Marie Curie. He used something called alpha particles and what, this is what he would expect. If, if an atom was like a plum pudding these alpha particles would just zip straight through. So he fired alpha particles at a very 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 thin foil of gold to see what would happen and he discovered that most of them did go through but when he looked carefully, he discovered something else. What he actually found was these results. <coughs> he discovered that, as well as most of them going straight through, some of them, look at these ones here, bent right back. So most of them were deflected not at all, or a small amount, but some of them came right back at him, and that was a big surprise. So here's what happened in terms of his observations. First observation was that only a tiny proportion of the alpha particles is deflected. So that made him realise that most of the atom must be empty space. We're talking 99.9999999999% empty space, which in itself was a big step forward in our understanding. This table is mostly empty space. But some of those particles are deflected a lot. Now these particles, these alpha particles, were really big. They were the most energetic particle anybody had ever discovered. He said it was like firing a cannon at a sheet of tissue paper and having the cannonball bounce straight back. So clearly inside all this empty space there must be something that was big and heavy. That's got a lot of mass. He also said that because some of the particles came straight back, it looked like they were being repelled. Now he already knew that the alpha particles were positive, so he concluded that this heavy part of the atom must also be positively charged. And that's the evidence that we have for our model of the atom. This is what you've been learning since year 7. Here we go. There's the sort of model that you've seen before. So, in the middle you've got protons and neutrons. We now know they've got roughly the same mass as each other, so we call it a relative mass of 1. And around the outside we've got the electrons, so the negatively charged electrons go round and round the outside of the 
nucleus which contains the positively charged protons and the neutral neutrons. Let's see that in a table. <coughs> oh, no, oh, somebody next. So we discovered the evidence for the nucleus with this alpha particle scattering experiment and Rutherford came up with the idea that the electrons must be orbiting around the outside of the nucleus. Here's our table. Okay, so we say this, this mass is actually really small. It's 1.67 times by 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. But because the proton and the neutron are almost the same, we give them a relative mass of 1. Now, the electron's got a tiny charge, 9.11 times by so mass, 9.11 times by 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. It's minuscule. So we say relative to a proton or neutron, it's about zero. It's about one two thousandth. But it does have exactly the opposite charge to a proton. So if a proton is plus one, the electron must be minus one. Now obviously most atoms contain quite a lot of protons and neutrons. Here's one example. Okay, a helium has a total of four protons and neutrons. So we give it a mass number of four. That's the top number. Obviously you've got a symbol for it, so you can find it in the periodic table. And this number down here, two, represents the number of protons. We call it the proton number. Let's have a look at a few atoms. Here's one I made earlier. Okay. So, in the middle, you've got two protons, they're in red, and we've got two neutrons, and orbiting around the outside of the electrons. Now, I wasn't sure if I should do it this way, because the scale is terrible. In fact, if this nucleus was the size of a golf ball, then these electrons would be somewhere going around the outside of like Wembley Stadium. So if you put a golf ball on the centre spot, these would be somewhere around the outside. So the scale is very bad. Okay, so we've got two protons, which means it must be helium. Everything with two protons is helium. And the mass number is four. So the total number of protons and neutrons is four, which means four take away two leaves us with two neutrons. Let's build something else. Let's build a carbon. Okay, so carbon carbon 12, okay, must have six protons. So, get a couple more protons and put those in the middle. Now, if the mass number is 12, the total number of protons and neutrons is 12. So if I take away the six protons, I'm left with six neutrons. Here we go. One, two, ooh. I haven't put enough protons in yet either, have I? Is this right? Four, five, six. No, see up. Here's those others, and this to balance it up to keep it balanced. I must also have a few more electrons. You always have the same number of electrons as you have protons. Right, move on. Okay, let's do nitrogen then. Well, proton number is 7. Here we go. The mass number is 14, so I'm going to have to put an extra neutron in there. And of course, oops, we're going to need an extra electron to balance it out. Next one. Here we go. Okay, this is uranium. It's got 92 protons and 235 uh, as a mass number, which means it actually has. 143 neutrons. So, see how we go. It's a bit of a mess. Something like that. Okay, move on. Okay, if we have a look at a periodic table then, something like this one. Okay, we can see that the periodic table is always based around the proton number. Hydrogen is 1, helium is 2, lithium is 3, magnesium is 12, cobalt is 27. This is the important number. It's the, uh, 
it's the, the proton number which is the most important number because it tells you what element you're going to have. Okay. So, the proton number always determines which element an atom is going to be. So, every atom of magnesium has got 12 protons. Every atom with 12 protons has to be magnesium, and that rule is always true. So, it's 6 protons for carbon, it's 7 for nitrogen, it's 12 for magnesium, it's 92 for uranium. Add that to our summary. <coughs> Okay, let's have a quick look at a little bit of video to tell us something new. Here we go. Listen carefully. Okay, so what the naked scientist is explaining is this. You can have two carbon atoms, they're always going to have six protons, must have six protons to be carbon, but some carbon atoms have got six neutrons and others have got eight neutrons. If I hadn't made such a mess of that, I'd be able to show you. Anyway, let's add that into our summary. Here we go. So, isotopes are atoms of the same element that contain different numbers of neutrons, always the same number of protons. We're going to leave this table here, pause it later on, copy out the table and have a go. See if you can work out what these other isotopes might be. You're going to need to use a periodic table. Okay, thanks very much. That's all folks. We're going to be using our information we found out in our next lesson. Just remember, before you go, quick reminder of your objectives. Are you able to give evidence to support the model of the atom? Can you write down nuclear notation for isotopes? Test yourself with a table. Don't forget then, you've watched the video, stop and rewind if you need to. Make a summary of what you've learned. I have learned that. And don't forget to ask me some questions next lesson. Thanks very much. I'll see you again.